Thanks, John, uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. First, I'd like to invite you to our upcoming lymphoma meeting, which will be next uh, month. And the information is down there on the website. If you're interested in registering, please do so. All right, so immune therapy is picking up uh, pace lately, and there's different versions of it uh, that, um, oops, uh, so CAR T cells, um, I think it's getting a lot of tractions lately. By specific antibodies, the uh, experiment was done with bite plenitumumab, uh, although it's relatively a difficult a drug, but it was proof of, of, of principle that this bispecific strategy is is um, is uh, a good idea to pursue, and there's different versions of this, the darts and the true bispecific antibodies also gaining tractions lately, and immune checkpoint inhibitors. And I'll focus mainly on immune checkpoint inhibitors in the interest of uh, time. And for simplification, you can think of T cells um, are, um, are controlled, activation is controlled by sets of proteins on the surface that can activate it or inhibit its activation. So these are like accelerators and these are like the um, brakes. So if you want to activate T cells therapeutically, you need to use uh, agonistic or activating antibodies to trigger these receptors or use blocking antibodies to uh, inhibit these receptors. And there's now a trend to use a different combination of these uh, uh, different strategies. You can use um, a blocking and activating antibodies or two blocking antibodies. So these are uh, already ongoing in uh, clinical trials. For now, we'll focus on PD-1 because the, this is where most of the positive data are coming uh, out in, uh, in lymphoid malignancies, especially in Hodgkin lymphoma. I think the first hint came in uh, for the potential utility in, in Hodgkin lymphoma came in um, uh, from a Japanese group published in Blood in 2008, where they showed that somehow um, Hodgkin cell lines have a higher expression of PDL1 and PDL2 compared to other uh, B cell lymphoma cell lines. And they've showed that uh, the expression of LMP1, which is related to viral infection with EBV, may trigger the uh, a gene expression of PDL1, PDL2. But then when they went back uh, and did immunohistochemical staining of LMP1 in the primary tissues and tried to correlate this with a PDL1, PDL2, they did not see correlation. What this tells us that EBV may contribute to PDL1, PDL2 expression, but not is the only mechanism uh, for that. About a year uh, later, a Margaret Ship group then um, uh, added uh, some interesting data to this observation with uh, observing that there's a genetic link that may explain the um, uh, overexpression of PDL1 and PDL2 in Hodgkin lymphoma. Again, we're looking at uh, uh, lymphoid malignancy cell lines. If you look at diffuse large B cell lymphoma, there's little, if any, PDL1 or PDL2 expression. Compared to primary medicinal large lymphoma, you can see this huge um, expression level of both PDL1 and PDL2. And again, Hodgkin lymphoma cell lines almost uniformly express high levels of PDL1 and PDL2. If you try to correlate the level of expression with copy number of uh, PDL1, you can see it here. Those with higher levels of PDL1, PDL2 have higher copy numbers of PDL1, 3.8 here, and here up to 7.4 copies of uh, the gene. And it, it turned out that uh, these uh, uh, genes, PDL1, PDL2, are located on Amplicon 9P24.1, which also um, contain the gene for JAK2, which is in, in somehow indirectly lead to the upper regulation of PDL1 again in Hodgkin lymphoma uh, cell lines. So the model right now, there's uh, EBV infection that can contribute to PDL1 expression, but there's genetic alteration, mainly genetic amplification of 9P24.1 that um, either directly uh, lead to amplification of PDL1, PDL2 genes, or indirectly by, by uh, 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 amplifying uh, JAK2 and therefore PDL1, PDL2. The target, which we'll talk about in a minute, in, in most of the times in the Hodgkin lymphoma, is a PD-1, which is expressed on the T cells, not on the malignant cells. And then, therefore, what you want to do, interrupt this interaction, either by targeting PD-1, blocking antibodies, and there's now uh, trials looking at PD-L1 uh, interruptions, predominantly for now in non-Hodgkin lymphomas and, and, and other solid uh, tumors. So then, uh, in the context of a, a large phase one that included multiple subsets, including Hodgkin lymphoma, the signal came very surprising to many of us that uh, there's a, this remarkable activity of, of PD-1-targeted agents, and, and both drugs, nivolumab and pembrolizumab, were used simultaneously in parallel clinical trials. So this is the data from nivolumab. The phase one was initially published by Steve Ansel in the New England Journal of Medicine, 
looking at responses, almost everyone responded in this clinical trial, and many of them achieved at least partial remission. The overall response rate exceeded 80%, and regardless whether you had a prior autologous transplant, no prior uh, 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 brentuximab vedotin, or, either, or had a prior brentuximab vedotin, or whether you had both autologous transplant and, and uh, brentuximab vedotin. So the signal was there, regardless of the prior treatment regarding a transplant or brentuximab uh, vedotin. And this data was uh, recently uh, uh, updated by um, uh, Steve Ansel at ASH, again looking at um, um, more um, uh, long-term follow-ups and also toxicity profiles. We have 23 patients treated, and mainly nodular sclerosing Hodgkin lymphomas. Not all of them had a prior autologous transplant, but the majority had a prior autologous transplant, 78%. And again, not all of them had a prior brentuximab vedotin, but the majority had a, a, a prior brentuximab vedotin. And the number of prior treatment regimens on average was five and ranged between two and up to 15 prior treatment regimens. What you need to know that these agents have some uh, serious side effects, but rare, relatively rare, and most of the, most of the times are reversible. Um, as you can see here, the uh, common side effects that are seen are mainly um, due to gastrointestinal, hepatic, some, some rare pulmonary uh, toxicities, and then also hypersensitivity. Uh, but almost all of them uh, were reversible in the context of this uh, clinical trial. And this is a water, updated waterfall plot, again, in, uh, from the phase one trial. Uh, the overall response rate, 87%. Most of the responses were partial remissions, although there was few uh, complete responses. The CR rate was 22% in uh, this uh, study. And the responses were quick. You can see most responses occurred within the first two to three months. And some of them were like delayed. So initially you have some reduction in the tumor measurements. It takes longer time to meet the criteria for partial remission. But most responses were seen within two to three months of initiating uh, therapy. And as some of these uh, responses were durable, you can see the progression-free survival exceeded one year and a half, and the duration of response was also uh, exceeded one year and a half, which is more than what we've seen with brentuximab vedotin uh, uh, in the past. And the second uh, anti-PD-1 is uh, the one that's uh, epimbrolizumab, which is reported by uh, Philippe Armand uh, this past ASH, initially reported by my colleague Craig Moskowitz about a year ago. Again, small number of patients. This is in context of a large phase one trial that included multiple subsets, including Hodgkin, non Hodgkin, and, and, and multiple myelomas. And, and here are, are the uh, uh, patient characteristics. Again, not all, everyone required to have prior autologous transplant, but m all of them had the prior brentuximab vedotin. So you can't compare these two uh, uh, trials because they had different eligibility criteria. Uh, you can't compare the response rate in these two phase one trials. But regardless, you can see here, again, a high response rate, 65% response rate. And again, in the waterfall plot, almost uh, um, uh, all of them, it's about 90%, had some benefit reduction in, in tumor measurements by waterfall plot. And the progression-free survival was also remarkable, exceeded brentuximab vedotin, uh, uh, as I mentioned. So here we are. Uh, you have two active agents uh, that target PD-1, pembrolizumab and uh, nivolumab. They gave 65%, 87% response rate in heavily treated patients with uh, relapsed Hodgkin lymphomas with CR rates uh, about 20%. If you look at other su subtypes of uh, lymphoid malignancies, the data is uh, even more limited because, again, this was a phase one trial that included follicular lymphomas, large lymphomas, multiple myelomas, and, and Hodgkin lymphomas. So very few patients were treated, at least in the nivolumab study that had been reported publicly. Four out of 10 patients with relapsed follicular lymphomas had a response, 40% response rate, and four of 11 patients with relapsed diffuse large follicular lymphoma had a response for a response rate of 36%. The data with pembrolizumab has not been reported publicly yet, although the, the trial is uh, enrolling patients. So here we stand with the PD-1 or PD-L1 targeted therapy for cancer, and we're comparing now the response rates across different diseases. As you know, PD-1 and PD-L1 have been approved by the FDA uh, for treatment of several solid tumors, including melanomas, non-small lung cancer, and renal cell carcinomas. But in, in, in almost all these trials, the response rate barely exceeded 20% in unselected patients. And we're talking about response rate with pembrolizumab and nivolumab exceeding 60 uh, to 65%, which is really remarkable. So there's now hype and excitement about this, and everybody wants to combine their PD-1 or PD-L1 with other agents, including chemotherapy. Uh, biologic agents, Revlimid, Ibrutinib, 
lymphomas, and, and so forth. And I'll show you some of these examples that are ongoing clinical trials. The first, uh, there is a, a rationale for combining uh, a PD-1 or PD-L1 target therapy with uh, ibrutinib. This came from a preclinical work by Ron Levy, and I'll show you in a minute, uh, justifying the combination of ibrutinib with uh, PD-1 or PD-L1 target therapy. The justification is that ibrutinib not only target BTK in the malignant cells, and therefore can help with the response, but can also inhibit ITK in T cells and can help with activating T lymphocytes. So it have dual effect in this regard. So if you combine it with PD-1, you can have an additional push for T cell activation while the T cells are already responding by hitting BTK in the malignant uh, B cells. And he did the experiment, uh, in, 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 at least in mice, where he had a B cell lymphoma <coughs> model, uh, no treatment, uh, ibrutinib alone. You can see the, the tumor growing with anti-PD-L1 in uh, the tumor growing. In the combination, you can see delay of tumor growth. What was more remarkable that the model worked in, in, in tumors that they don't even express BTK, solid tumors, like triple negative uh, breast cancer, which means that the, probably this push is coming mainly by inhibiting ITK in T cells more than inhibiting BTK in the B cells. So there's a trial now looking at this combination, not only in B cell lymphomas, but also in solid tumors, trying to take advantage of this synergy that's seen at least in the preclinical models. So there's two parallel trials now looking at this um, at combinations, one using PD-1 antibody and one using PD-L1 antibody, uh, but it, both combining with ibrutinib, almost similar trial designs with three different cohorts, one in high-risk CLL patients and then uh, one with uh, two different cohorts in B cell lymphomas, follicular B cell lymphoma and diffuse large B cell lymphoma. This is, uh, again, an ongoing clinical trial. For Hodgkin lymphoma, I mentioned that uh, there is um, a genetic explanation for the upregulation of PDL1, including JAK2. So there is an idea to inhibit JAK2 and uh, combined with PD1 or PDL1 antibodies to give it a, a second bush. But also looking at PD1 expression in T cell lymphoma, it seems that being regulated with HDAC inhibitors, and therefore, if you can in combine PD1 or PDL1 with HDAC inhibitors, you may have some synergy, and I'll show you some of these examples. So HDAC inhibitors have dual effects. They have direct uh, killing effect. If you dump HDAC inhibitors on tumor cells, they can kill. But it, also they have immune modulatory effects. They, they regulate a lot of cytokines and chemokines and a signaling transduction pathway that it can also involve in regulating the immune response. So you can have a dual effect of immune regulations and indirect um, cell uh, death. So just to show an example how this works, this is in the context of uh, a clinical trial that we've done a few years ago where we had initial window of treating patients with uh, 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 relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma with azacitidine, and after one week we added uh, the HDAC inhibitor, which is in this example MGCD103, which is now called mocetinostat. And we're looking at peripheral blood from patients getting this treatment. This is not in vitro, this is in vivo treatment. So if you look at the expression of a PD-1 uh, uh, antigen on peripheral blood CD8 positive T cells, you can see a lot of PD-1 expression on T cells of Hodgkin lymphoma patients. If you treat with azacitidine, nothing changes. Once you introduce HDAC inhibitors, you can see major downregulation of PD-1, both on CD8 and CD4 uh, positive T lymphocytes. And if you look at um, the same agent in cell lines, you can see massive induction of cell death seen as activation of caspase 3 here. The second uh, experiment that we've done is in a pilot study in the context of another HDAC inhibitor in, in relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma, which is panabinistat. This trial now uh, published a few years ago, but it's an oral drug given three times per week, and we collected blood before and after one week of therapy, so only three doses of panabinistat. Again, the clinical responses seen here in this uh, trial, uh, the overall response rate was relatively low, only about 24%. But you can see the majority of patients has some reduction in the waterfall plot uh, measurements. But back on the PD-1 uh, regulation, here's a peripheral blood from patient 1 and patient 2 looking at PD-1 expression. Again, on CD8, uh, you can see high levels of PD-1. Um, after one week of therapy, which is only three doses of uh, uh, panobinistat, you can see remarkable reduction of uh, PD-1 expression. And there's other uh, immune regulatory uh, effects of uh, HDAC inhibitors, such as uh, upregulation of OXF40 ligand. To make a long story short, we have now a trial that is in, in, uh, in the work um, uh, combining intinistat plus uh, pembrolizumab in patients with relapsed Hodgkin lymphoma, looking at uh, the dual regulation of PD-1 and inhibition of PD-1 in, in this patient uh, population. 
There's also interest in combining PD-1 uh, with uh, 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 engineered T cells. Again, with this effect, you can give the T cells a, a further push to activate it uh, in vivo. And there's trials that are trying to combine exogenous PD-1 or PDL one with CAR T cells. What we're doing here right now is we're working with Rainier Bringers from our group to engineer the CAR T cells to secrete single chain um, uh, FE fragment that target PD-1. So the T cells mix its own PD-1 antibody locally and inhibit PD-1. And then and lastly, uh, there's interest in combining by specific antibodies. Again, you bring T cells to the site of disease by, by specific antibodies and combine it with PD-1. There are clinical trials looking at this uh, also combination that you'll see it soon uh, near you. Very quickly, how to combine this with uh, combination chemotherapy. There's interest in, in moving this uh, concept to uh, uh, combined with um, frontline regimens with diffuse large B-cell lymphomas, and there's ongoing trial with GCHOP, RCHOP in this setting with follicular lymphomas combining with bendamustine and also lenalidomide and Hodgkin lymphoma with uh, ABVD. And I'll uh, show you this uh, in, in very quick examples. This is, again, ongoing trial combining with G, CHOP, uh, or uh, G, bendamustine, initially in relapsed follicular lymphoma and large lymphoma, and now moving up front uh, to uh, untreated uh, patients. Um, in uh, Hodgkin lymphoma, there's a couple of clinical trial designs of combining PD-1 antibodies with ABVD. Initially, we proposed to use it as an adjuvant or maintenance setting after completing ABVD, whether, whether uh, uh, based on selection for PET positive or not. And now, this is a design that we adopted. This is, again, uh, is approved. Uh, this is going through the um, uh, approval process through our uh, 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 center, where we take patients with ABVD and only those with PET positive will add a nivolumab. But the phase one will include adding nivolumab backwards to avoid an un unnecessary toxicities. So the first uh, uh, cohort will add nivolumab to cycle six, then starting cycle five and fourth, so backwards uh, addition, and, and it eventually we'll, we'll treat patients with PET positive um, uh, scans after two cycles with the combination. PET negative will continue to get ABVD. So in conclusions, I think a therapeutic activation of autologous T cells is demonstrating clinical efficacy against a variety of lymphoid malignancies. This includes CAR T cells uh, by specific antibodies and most recently the immune checkpoint inhibitors. They do have unique um, mechanism of action, but also unique uh, toxicity profile that you should be aware of. And uh, the combination strategies are ongoing now. And thank you.